my name is Mary DeGrazia. I am with Kroll Cyber Risk. Um, as was mentioned earlier, my background is predominantly forensics. And when I came over to Kroll, uh, they were using something called carbon black. So I really began to see kind of how a hybrid approach, kind of between this forensic mindset and the threat hunting mindset could kind of merge and get some fantastic results. Um, I've been in the IT industry now for about 20 years, originally starting probably in the third grade on an Apple II Plus when my dad brought it home. Um, and I've been specializing in pretty much host-based forensics and incident response for about the last eight years. Um, my contact information down there is below if you have any questions um, or would like to get a hold of me after the presentation. Yeah, and my name is Scott Hansen, and uh, evidently I'm not quite as social as Mary. I've got fewer contact methods, but uh, you can hit me up on LinkedIn or email. Uh, so my background is actually in, in more enterprise IT, so I worked in the oil and gas industry for about eight years, and then I've since come over to Kroll as well in our cyber risk practice. So just to get, tell you a little bit more about what Kroll does and kind of our approach and our vantage point. So I, I did come from a uh, situation which was probably more like most of you in which I was an embedded you know, internal IT or security person working on Splunk and Carbon Black and all the other different tools that an enterprise shop would have. So that's a great vantage point to be able to set things up in advance of an incident, make sure you have the logging and data that you need, and then when something does happen, use that to inform your incident response. So Kroll, of course, we're more of a consulting company, so we come in post-incident, and we do um, you know, all kinds of cases from ransomware to typical uh, email compromise to you know, widespread Trojans or whatever it may be. And we also do a fair amount of credit card related cases. So we uh, work in the PFI capacity, that's PCI, forensic investigator. So this is a lot of times when Mary and I end up working together is we'll have kind of a, a handoff between, you know, we know there's a certain number of stores or locations for a restaurant or other retail establishment that have been compromised or e-commerce has been compromised. We'll often use something like carbon black response to go in and get visibility to what's happening now if the, you know, if the compromise is still happening. Plus, we use it to go back and get historical data. So we've learned throughout a lot of these engagements that there are a lot of commonalities that happen right from one case to the other. So you know, we've talked a lot in the conference. People mentioned different dates of how long does it actually take to identify some kind of a fraud that's incurred in your environment, or in, in our case that we're we'll talking about today, a credit card um, fraud. So you know, 100 days, 180 days, 190 days, whatever it may be, we don't get too hung up on it. But we can definitely validate from our casework that it takes a very long time, typically, to identify some of these cases. And, and it'll usually be because of a third party telling you, not you figuring out yourself. So that's where we kind of come in. And we found, with, especially in these cases, there's a lot of habits that actors will fall into. And this is, you know, of course, the whole basis of threat intelligence is can we somehow identify how does an actor usually operate? What are their tools, tactics, procedures when they get into an environment? Are they using a certain tool set? Do they rely on similar file names? Do they use the same folder every time to dump files or to stage? So we'll be kind of going through a case study that describes how we've been able to leverage some of the information we get from case to case, and then come back and bring that to bear on an investigation to find deleted uh, artifacts of deleted data. Exactly. So the case study that I wanted to walk through today is um, we had an incident that we helped the client respond to. And in this particular case, they were injecting a process to scrape credit card data. Once they did this, of course, that data was then dumped out to an exfiltration file, this wmsetup.tmp. And it was located in a temporary location, see Windows temp. Uh, now, this we did find on systems. But if you think about how an attacker works, and as Scott mentioned, and as we've heard throughout this conference, the attackers a lot of times can be in the environment for quite a while. So in this particular instance, they were injecting a process. And they were coming back anywhere from every like one to two weeks. They would collect up this file. And then a new file was created on the system. So from an operating system perspective, um, you know, if they were in this environment, let's say February, and we start investigating in October, we may only see the last file that was created on the system. What about the 10 or, you know, 20 other files that existed on the system before we knew about this incident? We lose visibility into that because the timestamp that we see on this output file 
might be in October. So when we think about this time frame or how long you know, card data has been at risk, and it doesn't always have to be card data. What if you have a database and they were dumping out your database? Well, if you only have evidence of that last file, you're not going to know what data they grabbed back in February. So by utilizing the techniques that we're going to show you today, you can get additional visibility into files that have been deleted on the system without deploying full forensics. These are answers that hopefully you can get quickly, kind of do a little bit of light forensics on, without doing like this deep dive process. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was the dollar sign I30 file. This is the file that we're really going to be focusing on and talking about today. Um, this is a hidden file within the operating system. Um, you cannot see this file unless you access it with a forensic tools. So if you go into Windows and you change your settings and you know you view those hidden hidden system files, you will not see this file. So when we talk about using tools like maybe Xcopy, or you're using a tool um, to pull back or copy files, you're not going to have access to this file. It's a locked file on the system, and Windows just does not want you to have access to it. So the way to get this file is going to have to be a little bit of work. And why is this important? file important. Why do you care about this dollar sign I30 file? It contains a lot of information in it. The first thing it does is it just tracks whatever's in that folder for the NTF operating system for efficiency. So you know if you're an end user and you're clicking open a lot of the Windows Explorer, you're listing out directories, um, this would really help with that and with the efficiency of the operating system to track what's going on in that directory. It can contain deleted file information. So if a file or even a folder existed within that directory, this dollar sign I30 file can contain information about files that previously existed in that folder. And like when Scott mentioned earlier about staging folders, what we typically see our attackers have their favorite folders that they like to use as they move throughout your environment. It's less work for them to remember if they're compromised 20 different servers. They're going to tend to put their files in the same locations so they know whichever machine it is they're jumping to, they know where to find it. Um, the really cool thing about this file is that it can contain slack space. So when we talk about slack space on a file, and just for simplicity's sake, um, when you think about a sector size on a drive, so we'll just use 512 as an example. If you have a file that is maybe 400 bytes, the operating system actually designates the full 512 bytes on the sector for that file. So if you come in and you have a file that's 400 bytes, and maybe you delete some information, you get this area in between the end of your logical file and the physical space on the drive which means that entries that were once in that file that are deleted can be found within the slack space of that file. The dollar sign I30 also uses what's called B-tree to do like the, um, the storage of the data. Now, to be honest, I haven't really dealt with B-trees since college. But the important thing to know about them is the way that they organize their data is they shift it around a lot. And when they do this, they end up creating copies of a lot of the same data that you will find in the Slack space. So what this means to us um, as we're doing our investigations is we can find out a lot of information about files that previously existed on the operating system that we may not find evidence of anywhere else. So this includes things like the file size, the created and modified timestamps of the file, um, one thing that's really cool about the file size, when we start talking about files that an attacker dumps out, if they have something that's a gig in size, means something completely different than if it's one byte, right? So if you're looking back for deleted files, and you can see at the beginning, maybe they were only one byte at the beginning, a couple of bytes. Well, you know, maybe back in February or March, like their malware may not have been working as efficiently efficiently versus you know a gig file right towards the end. So this dollar sign I30 file really gives us a lot of visibility into data that has been deleted on the computer. And it's a relatively small file. 
Right, so kind of coming back to the, the case study we want to walk you through. So we found that, you know, a lot of times we're, we're kind of working back and forth. Like Mary mentioned, she'll be kind of deep diving on host-based forensics. My team and I, myself will be looking more at things like carbon black and looking at kind of the active incident unfolding if, if there is one. So Mary kind of comes and says, hey, is there some way we can obtain these I-30 files across different systems because we found evidence of deletion here? And so, of course, I just hop on to live response and I DIR and I'm not seeing any I-30 file and she's having to explain things to me. So th there's kind of a gap, right, because there's not really any EDR tool or similar type of um, system out there that I'm aware of that would automatically be logging information that comes from that I-30 file. So we just had to find some sort of a tool that would enable us to get to those, uh, which we'll kind of get to in a minute. And then once you figure out, okay, we need to obtain these files, we need to know where to look for them, this may vary right across different systems. So hopefully we do depend somewhat on actors being a little predictable and using similar file paths. So you need to have some kind of either um, indicators of compromise or some threat intel to go from. And we found that a lot of times just Google, again, is your best friend. You know, we searched on things like wmsetup.tmp and find some excellent write-ups from other people who've done investigations that are similar, found this kind of stuff, and, and then we know where to look. So, uh, the, the I-30 file, again, is a, is a locked system, so we'll talk about how to get that or locked on the file system. This is kind of one of those situations where you know, we had so many different stores, like this can be hundreds of different stores for an establishment. We don't have time and resources to go out to every one of those and obtain forensic images. So that, that's kind of the first thing an IR company thinks is like, let's just go image everything. We're trying to do things nowadays in a little more efficient way so that it you know, saves money, saves time, right? We're not having to coordinate all this and putting a big burden on our clients to, to kind of accommodate this forensic image collection. So yes, there's remote methods of doing that. I challenge you to do that over somebody's DSL line that they have in their restaurant in Idaho. And I always make fun of Idaho because I'm from Idaho. But uh, you know, this is not an easy problem to solve to just obtain a whole bunch of forensic images. So we're looking for something a little more uh, tactical. And so why not leverage something that we already have in place? And that for us typically is something like carbon black response because we're usually bringing in a tool set that didn't exist before and we're trying to, you know, if, if the uh, client had already had this stuff, we would use whatever they had on-prem. Usually they don't have something, so we'll bring in a hunting tool and then go from there. Exactly. So when we talk about the dollar sign I-30 approach, it's very targeted. There were some talks yesterday that discussed fidelity, where you don't want so much data that you miss what it is that you're looking for. So when we talk about the dollar sign I-30, think sniper. You're a sniper in there, you know what you're looking for, you're honing in on it, that is what you're collecting versus, you know, like the shotgun approach. I'm gonna go and collect all the things. So by the time you kind of take this approach, um, you're gonna be very specific about the data that you need to pull. You're gonna be looking to pull a specific file or a specific folder. Um, the tools that we're gonna go through and show you to use today, they leave a very low footprint. So me, I come from a forensics background, right? I get nervous when you start talking about jumping on a live system and doing things because I'm like, no, that's evidence, don't touch it. Um, so I like to minimize the footprint that I leave behind just in case we need to come back later and pull a forensic image. Um, and like how Scott was talking about earlier, this does reduce the on-sites. This reduces the images that we're going to be looking at. And it also reduces the wait time. So instead of going and pulling the forensic images to get to this deleted data, now you can pull it back with a tool or um, you, know, you can even use like PSSEC and RDP to get this information. Uh, anything you use within your environment where you're automating it. Um, we can reduce that wait time. Now we don't have to wait for full-on disk level forensics to recover evidence of deleted files. You can do it pretty simply and easily um, with a couple of tools. And once again, you get some very fast results. This scales very easily. Once again, uh, host level forensics does not scale easily. I could spend 40 to 80 hours on one system alone. That's just not practical in these large scale investigations. You need to get the data, you need to get it quickly, and you need to get the answers quickly. So when you go in and use this approach, you know what you're looking for. You know already what that staging folder is for the threat actors. If you're in a specific industry and you want to use this more for threat hunting, you should have an idea of who your target groups are that are coming for you. With the research, you might have some intel. Well, they typically use the C Windows temp folder. 
oh, I see this group likes to use the Mozilla data app folder, whatever. So you can use it to threat hunt, but once again, it's very specific and it's gonna be very targeted to a specific folder within the system to get this dollar sign i30 file. Um, and once again, if you are looking across your entire environment, once you know the attackers are using a certain folder, you may be able to identify additional systems that you weren't aware of that they had compromised. And it defeats the anti-forensics. The attackers are in there cleaning up after themselves. If it's been 90 days, if it's been 100 days, how do you find evidence of it? And this file is fantastic for doing it. Now, in order to use these utilities to pull the dollar sign $i30 file, we have to take a step back and use something that's called the MFT. The MFT is the master file table on the NTFS system, and it tracks all the files and folders that are created on a system. We need to use this MFT to get what's called the record number for the dollar sign $i30 file. Basically, it's an index. It's a unique identifier. The MFT tracks every single file and folder on the system. So, of course, there is a unique identifier for every single one of those files and folders. So, in order to do that, one of the quickest ways is to pull this MFT file. Right, so kind of as we described, we have a few steps that we have to kind of go through and we can, we'll kind of demonstrate how you do it manually first and then how you kind of go through and automate and we'll get into more detail in each one of these. But essentially, it's just figure out how you're going to grab the MFT, right? So it's not one of, again, it's not one of those files you can just get in the system and copy off. You're going to have to use some kind of a tool to pry it from the grip of the file system. Uh, then once you've got those, you know, so this should be from a population of systems that are either identified right from either you know report that you received or from you know forensics or threat hunting now we know okay we've got 20 systems that we consider at risk or 100 systems or 500 or whatever we're going to need to grab the MFT from at least a sample of those if not all and then uh, but that, that's still a fairly small piece of data to grab once you grab and compress and pull it back and then identifying that folder number is kind of part of the forensic team right uh, responsibility so okay how do I go in there and identify out of all these MFTs can we grab through and get the folder number once obtained, then now we know, okay, now from all these systems, we can go back and grab that specific I-30 entry from, the, you know, that corresponds to that entry number, work through the parsing of it. We'll show you a couple tools that we found that were good for parsing the I-30 file. And then, of course, it's going across one means find evil. So hopefully through all this, our, our end result is we can now say with confidence, right, back to the, the client or the card brands, we can now identify for sure which systems had the card data. So in getting the MFT, right, as I mentioned, there's a couple of options you can use. We found, we often use TZ Works tools. They are commercial, but they work super well, especially where something like Carbon Black Live Response, where they're command line based, they're kind of single purpose, they're lightweight, right? So something like NTFS Copy is a good one to be able to obtain that MFT. There's also um, free and open source raw copy. Probably some of you bumped into uh, to that tool. We found that that works well here, and we'll kind of come back to that again on the obtaining of the I-30 file. So just a couple simple ways to get the file and then kick it over for forensics. Right, and then once we get in on the forensics side, and although we say the forensic side, these are all command line tools. So this doesn't have to be a forensic person doing this. This can all be rolled into one process. This is just kind of how we work within our team. But this would very easily be something Scott can just hold on and to do, but you know, he wants me to keep my job. So he gives me this extra data so I can work with it. And so once we get the MFT, we have to use a command line tool to parse it out. And um, in this particular instance, I use a tool created by Eric Zimmerman. Uh, Eric Zimmerman is also a SANS instructor, and he uh, has a lot of great free tools out there. And this is just a nice, simple, easy tool to use. You point it at the MFT file, you tell it, hey, give it to me in CSV format, and it's gonna pop that out for you. Then the next thing you wanna do is find the MFT sequence number or that unique ID for that particular folder that you're interested in. So for our case, it was a C Windows temp folder. So I simply locate that in the CSV file and I pull out that entry number. Um, once I have that number, that's the key that I need to be able to get, or Scott needs to be able to pull out the dollar sign I30 file. Like we mentioned before, it's a locked hidden system operating file. So you can't go in there and just use a typical copy command. So you gotta kinda use this roundabout way to pull this file. So once we have that, 
Um, I turn that number over to Scott, and he runs with it and starts to do the next process. All right, so raw copy is kind of the tool. So we found, at least at the time that we did this, and it was probably a few months back when we were doing this investigation, but TZWorks tools didn't have any way really to grab the i30 file, just wasn't one of the attributes that they would pick up. So just doing a little bit of research, again, coming back to raw copy, we did find that um, has a particular command line switch that enables you to get um, index attributes, and you use that switch shown there at the end, the slash all, ATTR, colon one. So when you use that, and this is just kind of a, a one-off example, but you know each um, MFT number that you um, request in the command line, you then use the all at ATTR and uh, grabs the .bin file. So these are how we get them kind of one at a time. And then you know again, we're trying to figure out okay, how do we then scale this? So this is cool. You know I'm glad I can get this from one system. Uh, we use Carbon Black Live Response. So the um, you know, one at a time method is if you have some, and again, this is just kind of a generic interactive method, so use PS exec, use RDP, whatever you like. Um, some other EDR tool probably could do the same thing. Uh, so that's great for the one at a time command. And then we just figure out, okay, now we need to get this across X number of systems. So if you're really lucky and you have a predictable uh, MFT number that's gonna be consistent across a bunch of systems, you can just throw that one command and execute that. So we already had a um, little API driven um, data grabber script that we use with Carbon Black. So we had already been getting things like event logs, uh, registry hives, you know, doing other types of forensic collection. This is just one more um, add-on into that particular framework. And at the end, we'll have a link to, to the framework that we use in Carbon Black. And then you, know, you just throw in the command and put the number in there. Obviously, if you need to do a substitution on where the actual MFT uh, sequence number is, you can script that in as well. So this allowed us to go through and grab from hundreds of systems this particular um, I-30 output. Exactly, and then once again, once Scott gets this data, he turns it back to me, and then I use a utility to parse it out. Um, in this particular instance, I had to find the right tool to do this job. Of course, like some Google Kung Fu, I found a lot of tools that would parse out this dollar sign $i30 file. It's not a new artifact in the forensic world. It's one that we just really haven't leveraged in quite this way in conjunction with pulling back triage data, or one that I've seen uh, done quite this way. Uh, a lot of the tools that I found out there did not address that slack space in the file. And that slack space is critical because that can contain a lot of information and a lot of references to deleted files. And sometimes there can be a ton of entries. So by using Python, you can just parse this file out relatively quickly, you know, give it the dash C for a CSV file. And then in this particular instance, the dash D, which is critical to get that slack space. And here's just an example of what it looks like, pretty straightforward. Now, once again, this can all be scripted out. You don't have to sit there and type these commands out. You can get a pretty clean process going. And here's an example of what the output looks like. Here you can see there are multiple references to the wmsetup.tmp file. Now you might, in here, um, I had to change some of the data to protect the client, um, but you might have an instance where you might have five or six of these and they'll all have different timestamps associated with them. So now you have visibility into how many times this previous file actually existed in that folder at potentially different states depending on that file size, which is huge. Um, in this particular instance for our case, uh, even forensically, there was no evidence on this particular system other than in this dollar sign i30 file. It wasn't in the MFT that I referenced before, you know, running keyword searches over the system. Uh, it wasn't in any of the journal files associated with NTFS. We have stuff called our log files that we look at. This was literally the only place on the computer that I found evidence that this file existed on there. And in our particular case, even though we had logs, sure there were log files that showed the attacker was compromising the system, but because they were injecting a process and running their malware there, over the course of six months that system had been rebooted. So this was the only way that we could definitively state not only did they compromise the system, but they were also able to meet their objectives, which was ultimately scraping that credit card data. So for us, this dollar sign i30 file was a huge payoff and really provided us a lot of valuable information. Probably not information our client was too happy to hear about and probably wished that we didn't find, but you know, ultimately we have to do our job whether it makes them happy or not. 
So just to kind of recap, this can all be automated. Uh, as Scott was talking about earlier, you can automate this with whatever EDR solution you're using. Even if you don't have that solution, just using PSExec or if you're using SCCM, anything where you are automating, you know, you can push out a batch file, whatever it is you need to do to automate this. There's simply command line tools that you can use to grab data. Um, once you do that and you get the MFTs back and you parse them, you can automate that again with whatever regular expression searching mechanism you like to use, whether it's grep, sed, awk, python. One thing I haven't heard here too often at this conference is Perl. Does anybody use Perl? I, okay, so yes, but do you prefer <laughs> Python or do you like, or you'll just use Perl when you have to? Uh, Perl, you go through Python, Python comes over to the only search Ah, okay. it's like the Android iPhone debate, I think. You're one <laughs> or the other, right? Um, so anyways, you can use whatever mechanism you like to automate this process. You can grep for that MFT uh, number and then once you have that, you can kick out a script to collect that dollar sign I30 and then you know use another script or whatever to loop through, parse out all those dollar sign I30 files. And in my case, you know, I just grep for the wmsetup.tmp files to see which system it's on. Um, you know, in this format, we kind of have these all in bits and pieces, but it can very easily be rolled up into one streamlined process. The really cool thing was about the C Windows temp folder, because this was based off of a base image that was pushed out through the entire environment, that MFT sequence number ended up being the same for every system within the environment. So you might not even have to do all of these steps if you have a base image that you're working with and the attackers are utilizing something that's part of your base image to drop their data in. So you might even be able to get this down to you know, fewer steps. And one thing that kind of cracks us up is when you'll see on a system, IT administrators have their own folder that's sitting there that says, you know, C colon IT support, and that's exactly where the actor dumps all of their tools as well because it's a whitelisted folder and it's unable to execute anything. So anyway, it's kind of one of those funny things, but makes it predictable again for us. Yeah, it makes it nice. Um, so kind of just in summary, the dollar sign I30, why, why is this file important to you? Why might you want to consider it for your investigations? One, you can recover deleted and recover deleted information, which traditionally has been forensics, but now you can kind of bring that into your world, find deleted information without having to bring in forensics people or the forensics track. You can have access to this data leveraging your existing tools. Um, you can check for those staging folders within your environment. Once you kind of find out where the attacker's going and where they're dropping their tools, you can look for that on a wide scale and especially if they've been deleting and then cleaning up after themselves, you can look in that staging folder and maybe see what other tools they've been using that you might not have visibility into because they've been deleting and cleaning up as they go. It can help you fill out gaps in your timeline. Like I mentioned before, if they're putting tools on there, you're just gonna have visibility into the most recent output file or the most recent tool set on there. This can help you fill out some gaps in your timeline. If you're wondering, well, I know they were in my environment six months ago, but I only really have visibility into what they were doing recently, this can help you see what they may have been up to. And once again, it can help you identify those additional systems. There are some caveats uh, that we feel that are important to bring up using this methodology. First of all, uh, like we talked about before, it's targeted. This is not a wide scale, uh, you know, you're going to put an alert in to look for something like this. Usually, you will have in mind some IOCs that you're going to need to focus on to do this. So although it's targeted, that also means that your results are probably going to be pretty useful to you and not have a lot of false positives. You need to have some way, of course, to access those systems remotely. So have some EDR deployment or you know, some kind of mechanism in place where you can access all the systems across your environment easily. Um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. What I mean by this is if you go into that $I30 file and you don't find anything, that doesn't mean you get to clear the system. It simply means that you didn't find any evidence in there. And the reason that is, is, you know, I was talking before about like 
the, the file slack. Well, it might be that that file doesn't have a lot of slack space in it, so the entries in there get overwritten quickly. So just because you don't find an entry in there for you know the card output file or the SQL dump or the tool, doesn't mean that it did not exist on that system. It just simply means that the dollar sign I30 doesn't have evidence of it. So um, it's pretty important to keep that in mind. Um, so right here we just have a list of some of the tools that we referenced during the talk, the MFT command, the raw copy. Um, these are all free tools with the exceptions of the TZ Works tool, which is actually very reasonably priced. And it's a whole suite of tools in there. You can deal with event logs, registry hives, a bunch of cool things. Um, Scott, I'll let you talk to the Carbon Live response triage because I'm not too familiar with that. Yeah, so we've just kind of recently um, published this out on GitHub. It's a, a fairly simple framework, but we wanted to provide something that we use a lot to get uh, forensic artifacts off systems. So if you go out there to our GitHub site, it's essentially just if you happen to be a user of Live Response, it's not really easy. It's not evident, I think, out of the box for most people how you would use Live Response because it kind of brings you up a GUI and you just type commands in. There's a whole kind of API driven side to that. So this is kind of where you go in and say, okay, I have a list of artifacts I want to get, right? We talked about a bunch of those. How do we do that? How do we set up the job scheduler so that it goes out to X number of systems, pulls the batch, you know, that, those um, entries back in a batch, gives you some logging to tell you what's happening, kind of just bolts on a little bit of a data collector component to live response, which really isn't there out of the box. So feel free to hit that up and, and let us know if you have any feedback on that particular tool. Yeah, so that's pretty much what we have. We just kind of wanted to share how we kind of found our two worlds colliding and using a bit of the forensics along with you know, the threat hunting and leveraging those tools we thought was pretty exciting in this particular case that we worked and we found it really valuable. So, and also you know, hit us up on Twitter, LinkedIn for Scott. Um, although he says he's not very social, he is very sociable. <laughs> So, um, great, thank you. Okay. Thank you.